Good morning and welcome to the February uh, Michigan Financial Wellness Network Partner Coffee Chat. Uh, today's agenda is mostly focused on artificial intelligence, AI. Um, so I'm going to whip through very quickly my programming updates to allow for as much time as possible to go through the AI presentation. And then if we have time at the end this week, I'm kind of doing it upside down because we'll do um, partner roundtable um, at the end as time allows. So um, we're of course always seeking sponsors. I'm gonna give you updates on our um, kind of key initiatives. I'm gonna do the AI presentation. Our next meeting is March 13th. Uh, note that that's a week later than typical. And we're gonna do a deep dive on Smart Path. I think especially for those who are not classroom teachers, um, I'm inviting, I'm making special invitations to some of the social service agency folks that I work with. Uh, because I'd really like folks to understand how they can use the Smart Path um, tool with young people that they work with. So feel free to invite those that you uh, interface with who may not be classroom teachers, but have some sort of um, relationship with uh, groups of young people that might benefit from using Smart Path. So that's um, March 13th. Okay, our um, Smart Money Michigan Kids Read, uh, give you an update on that, Funding the Future. There's a, there are still a couple shows um, available. The Fempreneur Summit is cruising along and I am still waiting for an update on the Smart Money Magic Show. So our Smart Money Michigan Kids Read, our second original book, Owl and Otter, The Big Talent Show. Um, I'm doing a credit union deep dive on February 15th. So any credit unions, um, who typically attend the financial educator meeting uh, on the 14th, um, please put on your calendar that I'm going to do a full hour. We're going to read through the storybook. We're going to talk about some of the supplemental activities that will be provided. Um, and I can answer any questions that you have about libraries who are participating uh, and so forth. So the activity supplement is in development. The book distribution, you know, <laughs> All things um, go for hopefully distribution on March 4th, barring any uh, weather events or, or, or otherwise. Um, so we're hoping, you know, libraries are scheduling their programming now to take place during Financial Literacy Month. We've received over 160 requests um, and of the 9,000 copies that we have coming, um, I'm down to fewer than 200 copies. So if you work with libraries that do story times for young people between say three and eight years old, um, if you would like to know whether or not your partner libraries are participating, just send me an email with the name of the library and I can look at the master request list and let you know. So that would provide you an opportunity to either reach out to them and offer your support or if your partner libraries are not on the list, you could reach out to them and say, hey, did you know about this? Um, and I can uh, then correspond with them and get them the link. So there you go. We have under 200 copies available, 160 requests received. So funding the future, um, the spring tour, you can see here the updated schedule. A few things have changed since our meeting last month. So right now we have availability for sure on April 30th. And for the other dates where you see only one show scheduled, it is possible to do a second show depending on proximity because it requires you know, travel time, two hours to set up, time to tear down. So um, let me know if you have any middle or high schools in the kind of Southeast Michigan area, I would say, you know, South of Flint, um, and I can get them connected with our scheduler. Always looking for sponsors for those shows as well. So, okay, so the Fempreneur Summit happening during International Women's Week, which uh, our event is Wednesday, March 6th. We've increased our footprint um, at the venue, taking over more space because last year we sold out and we had exhibitors and attendees who wanted to participate but could not. So we're down to our last two of the 35 exhibit spaces. We increased that from 20 last year to 35 and we're down to our last two. So if you or anyone you know would like to be an exhibitor or um, just attend as a participant, which is a great networking opportunity, 
um, feel free to email me. Again, it's mifinancialwellness at gmail.com, and I can get you the appropriate links. Um, the uh, caveat with exhibiting is that we're working really hard to make sure there isn't uh, duplication. So for example, we will not have any other bank or credit union because Lake Trust is our elite sponsor. We won't have any other advisory firms because Mercer Advisors is the sponsor of our um, marketplace of exhibitors um, and so forth. So uh, the Eventbrite page where exhibitors can register, I keep that list updated so that if folks are interested in exhibiting, they need to take a look at who's already confirmed and make sure that there isn't um, someone already in that space. But everyone is welcome to attend as a participant and network and take advantage of all the sessions. Um, we're doing everything from the health and well-being of the whole woman, you know, from physical, mental, emotional, as well as business. So there will be very um, kind of B2B business segments uh, in the day, but there are also a lot of um, just female empowerment and support, lots of networking built in, time for the uh, marketplace exhibit fair and so forth. So March 6th, and it is in uh, right off of 275, uh, accessible from M14 and 8 Mile uh, 96, um, the venue is the Conference Center at Ward Church, which is at Six Mile and Haverty Roads. So anyone has interest in that or has a referral of someone who might benefit from either exhibiting, sponsoring, or attending, please shoot me a message and I can get you all of the links for uh, this event. So my final updates are here on the screen. Usually this is the closing slide, but today I'm just going to plop it in here. So as I mentioned already, we're doing our artificial intelligence session today. Uh, March 13th is our next time together. That's the second Wednesday of March because the first Wednesday is the Fempreneur Summit. And we're going to do a deep dive on Smart Path, that, that meeting. Um, so please feel free to um, extend the invitation for uh, nonprofit, government, uh, social service, any organization that you know who works with young people that would benefit from understanding the um, positive possibilities of using that platform. Um, so that's it. And the other dates we, have, of course, have on the calendar already, April 3rd and May 8th. Um, and then we'll probably do a brief hiatus over the summer unless we have interest in having meetings. I'm happy to do that over the summer if there is interest and we have um, content to cover. So with that, um, Derek, I know that this is probably more time than what I told you you could have, but I tried to consolidate my remarks um, as much as possible. So I will um, stop sharing and you should be able to share your screen and take us through um, as much of the AI presentation as you'd like. And I've attended several AI sessions with our school district here in Northville, as well as I just went through one uh, in parent camp um, with Michigan Virtual University last weekend. And it's both fascina fascinating and concerning. So Derek, take it away. Yeah, I mean, a knife can be fascinating, concerning too. Um, to, you know, it all depends how the tool is used. And that's one of the things that I think we all have to wrap our minds around. We're not going to stop uh, this thing from coming. Um, so it's more of a tool that we should have in our toolkit. And we need to teach responsible use. Um, like anything in life, uh, you know, it, it takes responsibility and using it right. Even with my children, um, I encourage them to use it, but not, you know, they've been ingrained with uh, schools about learning, not just doing and, and getting something done, because this can help cheating. It can can be all those bad things depending on how it's used. So um, I wanna show how to use it for good and how teachers can use it to be uh, better at reaching individual students and to help them critically think better. So that's really my focus. Uh, Kelly, before I get going, just um, so I do know time, uh, how much time do you want me to, to take here? You're on mute, so I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, four years and I still forget. Uh, <laughs> um, well, it's only 8.40, so I would say you have a okay. good 30 minutes. 
Okay. Well, I'm not going to take 30 minutes because I want to hear from people talking or, um, you know, give, give time for people to chat. Uh, so I'm going to, I've got a couple different hats. A lot of you know me as the Michigan Council um, president, but I also work for the Foundation for Economic Education. That's where I do a lot of my AI work. So um, the Foundation for Economic Education has um, a lot of resources for teachers, um, economics, personal finance, civics um, being developed as well. So if somebody was a uh, economics teacher, had to teach about um, supply the next day, they could go to the Learning Center resources and get a bunch of stuff, video clips, uh, presentations, um, assignments, lesson plans um, on whatever topic it is they're teaching. That's what the Learning Center resources are. And then daily, um, we have things that come out Mondays are Choice Economic Materials for Success, which takes articles and um, provides some questions and answers for students based upon those current event articles. Uh, Tuesdays is a companion edition, classroom edition of the Monday Morning Economist, which is um, subscribed by about 4,000 or so teachers now, I believe, that again takes a similar type of thing. A uh, This week was the value that Taylor Swift has added to the NFL um, through her relationship with Travis Kelsey and kind of looks at the different ways that an organization can grow either from internal growth or from external bringing um, others in or whether it's internal with productivity gains and things. And so we have assignments that go along with that. Uh, Wednesday, we do an economic marvels. This week um, is Birkenstocks. We've done a bunch of other things, Costco, um, Crocs and Ikea, Bucky's. Uh, so it's a slideshow presentation that can be used in class. Thursday is now our Financial Times, and uh, Fridays are usually a personal finance focus um, as well. So that's teachers.fee.org is the website for that. If you wanted to um, be a part of that, everything is at no financial cost. Welcome to this professional development that will help you embrace artificial intelligence in your classroom. My friend Derek from the Foundation for Economic Education is here to help break down barriers and foster a critical conversation about how artificial intelligence may transform education. We hope you leave inspired to harness the power of this technology to strengthen your students' critical thinking skills. Now let's see what Derek's got cooking. All right, so that was a tool called Eleven Labs. We haven't heard of it, it's real fun to play with. Um, I pay $5 a month for that uh, so that I can upload 10 audio clips and I can have 10 in my library at a time, I can cycle that library, but um, 10 audio clips, you just have to give them like four minutes of audio from whomever, and then you can type in whatever you want it to say, and it will spit it out for you. And you can do some adjustments to that uh, to help it sound a little bit better. Uh, it depends upon how clean the audio is. Typically I'll get some things from YouTube that have uh, like a, from a speech, that's usually the best thing. And then you want a distinctive voice. And that's uh, that's a tool called Love and Labs. And again, that can be used for really bad things as well as it's been in the news in the last month is being used for some um, campaign things. And I think that that's, you know, been an issue and they're trying to police that as much as they can as things get started. But uh, I like the idea of using that in the classroom as like, a okay, every day you come in, the students see the objectives on the board, right? Or the learning goal for the day. What if you had the rock? give the learning goal for the day or a special guest star every day, do it, you know, do a thing. Um, or, you know, maybe the rocks every Monday, whatever it happens to be, but things like that work in the classroom. Students will pay attention to that versus they probably don't pay attention to the learning objective written up on the board, um, at least after a certain amount of time for most students. So maybe it's a nice way to just hook the student's attention. Can I ask a right? question? Yeah, go ahead. Or, okay. Yeah, go. Um, so the voice of the rock, I mean, personally, I'd love to wake up to that voice every day, but um, speaking of classroom use, um, so this library of voices, I mean, is there, do, do, do we have, like, do they, have they given permission for their voice to be used? Like that seems. No, uh, no, this like, isn't, this is something that I created on my own, like within your own personal account, it's not available for anybody else to use other than me. You can upload okay. any audio and how you use it is more of the issue, right? So it's like, right. I can upload the audio, 
and then how I use it, that can become the issue. Um, gotcha. So I, I can upload, I've uploaded uh, Jerome Powell's voice, who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Now, if I, and it sounds really like him as well. Um, if I put that out there and acted like that was him for real, then that would be an issue, right? But sure. to use it to have the learning objectives at the start of the day, be Jerome Powell's giving those, like, I don't, I don't have a problem with that. I can sleep at night with that. Yeah, Derek, can you share the name of that app again? Yep, Eleven Labs. You you uh, um, write it out like E L E V E N L A B S. Um, it's Eleven Labs, and I think it's .io is the website address. Um, so Eleven Labs .io. And at the beginning have... of your, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was say at the beginning of your presentation, you were going through a lot of the like lesson plans and things that are available from uh, for to teachers from fee. Mm -hmm. For the for this audience who are not class traditional classroom teachers, are folk is that available to folks who are non traditional educators who might be, you know, an FEC at the credit union or other, yeah. you know what I mean? Or do they have to, is it only, is it exclusively available at no cost for traditional classroom teachers? It's available to the public at no financial cost. So okay. um, anybody can go sure. there. And, yeah. Anybody so we're using there. the, we're using the term teacher generically, right? So if you, if you teach children, whether it be classroom teacher or not, it's available. Yeah. I mean, we've got homeschool people. There's a bunch of people who, you know, utilize the site, um, and utilize the resources that are there. Um, there's on-demand professional development for each of the 20 economic standards that are the national standards. Um, and there's other you know, things being developed right now for the civics uh, aspect of things. So it's, okay. that's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's publicly available. Um, all right. So as far as discussion, I don't want to do that too much right now. I want to have that a little bit um, after I'm done presenting for about 20 minutes, but I would like it if you could on your um, toolbar there, Give me the emoji that represents how you feel about AI. Like if you're like happy about it, you could do the, like the party stuff. If you're like scared, you could do the scared face. Um, but any of the emojis there that describe how you feel without taking too much time to figure out about, about AI would be good. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to feel about it. And, and one one thing that I can tell you is that. I was not prepared when I first started presenting about this, how emotional people get about this topic. I mean, people just get so scared. They get emotional that it's going to take jobs. They get emotional that it's going to, um, you know, cause students to be even less able to critically think. And I think that all those are valid fears to have um, at this point, but uh, that's why it's important for us to kind of direct the discussion and direct how we want things to go with this. So, you know, it is transformative and I'm going to jump through these slides. I by no means um, feel that you can keep up with the pace I'm going to go and I'm going to jump past things, but I gave you the link to the whole presentation in case you want to look back at things. Um, but I didn't want to reorder the presentation and make it short and not provide you the other stuff. So I just figured rather I'd, I'd skip through things um, and give you a, a mini presentation. So GTP3 and GTP4, 4 is the paid version that people are using 3.5 I think is the free version 4.5 is the the paid version I do pay $20 a month for chat GPT um, I find that it's worth $20 a week um, I have no problems paying that amount of money um, I'll go out to eat you know fast food twice less a month in order to have chat GPT it just makes me um, better a able to do what I do for a living so um, that was uh that G GPT-4, I was using, because uh, I reached the maximum with GPT-4 yesterday, and I had to go to GPT-3 for like a half hour, and I noticed a significant difference with its ability to uh, do a good job for me, I guess, and, and give me work that I was used to with GPT-4. So there's a big difference between the two, but GPT-3 can do some pretty cool things in and of itself, um, but it doesn't have all the capabilities that 4 has. To give you an idea of how far far we've come and how fast we've come. This was March of 2022 to March of 2023 um, with giving the prompt in mid journey, which is a um, 
one that creates visuals like Dolly, if you've heard of it, Mid Journey is another one. It's probably the more popular, more powerful one um, of Donald Trump and Barack Obama playing basketball. Again, just a very good visual that tells us how far and how fast we've come. Uh, it does well on tests. That's really what this slide says. It does. It can pass AP tests, basically. Um, it can get a five. It can get a four on a lot of different AP tests. AP micro, AP macro economics, it got fives, um, the GPT-4. Uh, this is everybody's scare, right? Math teachers protest against calculator use. It's going to you know, be evil. Um, but at the same time, then I look at my daughter who's doing math as a sophomore that I did as a senior. So it hasn't ruined everybody. Uh, but at the same time, then I can see my son who's in seventh grade, whose teachers allowed him to use the calculator, especially when it was online schooling and everything. And he's he's more reliant on the calculator than I'd like him to be. And we're working that out of him now. Um, and, and I can see that that danger. But copy machines were a threat to writers. You know, um, basically they were saying, IBM was saying that their computer um, calculator was equal to 150 extra engineers. Well, last time I checked, we still needed engineers. So we, we have to understand there's going to be change. Maybe the tools that they're using are a little different, not using a slide rule anymore. But it's that lump of labor fallacy. Um, it overlooks how efficiency gains, uh, such as automation, not just lower costs, but also stimulate economic growth. And this is the number of all employees, total non-farm in the United States over time. And you don't really even see a dip when personal computing comes in or other things. You, you see more of a dip because of you know, the recessions, the economic issues that probably go along with um, with monetary policy more so than, than anything causing any of the dips here. All right. Um, as far as, again, what causes people's concern, well, they used to think that it would you know, take on 50% of the work we're currently doing by... Um, the 2050s, back in 2017, that's what they thought, maybe the mid-2050s. Well, now it's about a decade earlier. Um, in just six years, people are saying, well, it's probably going to get there a decade earlier as far as um, our current work being automated, 50% of our current work being automated um, by AI. All right, so we're going to skip past this slide and the slide and um, get you to think a little bit more about you know, the backhoe on the left likely caused a lot of construction workers to lose their jobs. Um, it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing, that we should get rid of the backhoe. Uh, and I want to have the mentality of AI will not replace you. A person using AI will. Um, I think that that has probably got a lot of truth to it. All right. We're not going to get too much into the ethical considerations um, today. So I'm going to kind of skip past that. But there's some stuff for you to look at from a great report on McKinsey Digital on... Um, on AI so that that port is linked in the slides that you can look at a little bit more if you want to. Um, I think constitutions will be an important part. What is the rules of the AI? What um, are the, the boundaries that has been given? And I think that'll become a bigger deal. So like anything, I remember when Google and everything first came out, it wasn't Google, that was more so the issue it was probably Yahoo or something. And, and they were starting to teach us how to search and you know, use. I remember something about using um, quotation marks and ampersands and all these other things would help you get better results when you were uh, searching. And it's really the same thing with ChatGPT and any type of AI. Prompt engineering is very, very important. You can put a poor prompt in there and get a poor result. You give it the right kind of prompt, you can get amazing results. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a moment. All right, but. Um, even telling an AI model to take a deep breath caused the math scores to study when it gave them a math problem. So you just gave them a math problem. Um, it scored 34%. You told it to think step by step through the problem, and it scored a 71.8%. And when you added um, take a deep breath and work on this model or on this problem step by step, it got an 80.2% which that just blows my mind. It just, it doesn't, I don't understand that, but it worked. It works, it replicated in studies. All right, so don't expect you to read this slide, but I'm saying like prompt engineering to the extreme. I mean, what I typically do is I'll have a prompt and I'll copy and paste it um, into ChatGPT so I don't have to write this kind of stuff out each time. Um, or you can put it in the custom instructions for your chat GPT. Or 
Um, now you can even create your own GPTs. Um, I'm doing some curriculum on Taylor Swift right now where I'm writing an economic workbook with Taylor Swift examples for every concept in economics, basically, or all the major ones. And I created a Taylor Swift GPT and I fed it all of Taylor Swift's music lyrics um, to have in its brain to help me develop these these things because I'm not a big Swifty. So it, it helps me out in that way. Um, and, and again, it's all about reaching those kids, right? Uh, that's what it, it's about. So prompt engineering to the extreme, you have to you know, give it instructions, tell it what you want it to do. Like even telling it, wait for a response is important. Otherwise it'll just spew everything at you. So wait for a response. You want, um, you know, you're asking the student to share their work with you. This is more of a, um, you know, a tutoring type of role that you're asking um, it to be with a student. All right, so it's has an interactivity. So we're, we use the, the term prep. We want to introduce the question with a prompt um, or, and then give it a role or voice, like what you want it to do. Um, be explicit in your instructions. I always say, you know, this is for a high school economics student. Um, this is for an AP world history student, whatever it happens to be. Um, set the parameters of the answer, like answer this in 100 words or less, answer this in 200 words or less, um, and it will help it be more concise of an answer. We, My daughter and I do this when we're doing her worksheet for each unit in world AP world history, and she knows she needs to learn the stuff for the AP test. Um, so we go through and we do it together, and and we use ChatGPT to just help us save time in the researching of the material so that we can have more of a discussion about how it all connects and what the material means. So um, so again, prep the machine, that prep model, and then you have to edit the output as well. That's also important. And this is where, again, maybe a kid doesn't have the ability to do this as much, to evaluate the AI output for language facts and structure. Yesterday, it made a mistake. It um, did something that, that I said, um, go back to your instructions and look, you made a mistake on this. Oh, I'm sorry. And it corrected its mistake. Um, determine the accuracy, uh, corroborate, corroborate it with source if you need to, or you can ask it to provide a source if you um, would like it to. Um, make sure you're looking for biases, misinformation, and, and transform based upon those new findings. That, that's an important piece of it. So I'm going to skip through some of this stuff, but to show you in this prompt, um, that a friend of mine created, create a bulleted list of characteristics for the different types of loans and credit listed below. So you're giving a prompt what you want it to do. All right, then you're giving it a role. You're a personal finance coach giving advice to a young adult about interest rates. Um, so that's the role. Okay, then the explicit instructions, what you want it to do, comparing interest rates on loans and credit cards from different institutions. And then the parameters, um, 10 bulleted statements for each type um, is, is what the parameters are. So those pieces are all very important. I think that's a, a great model, that prep model to use in those uh, instructions. So there's some great information out there by Dr. Molik. If you want to look up anything, you see Dr. Molik's name. That is probably the number one name I'm seeing in AI and education. So AI and education, Dr. Molik. There's a paper of his that is linked on the presentation for you. And there's Teacher's Prompt Guide to ChatGPT uh, as well. It's a great PDF booklet of examples of how to use ChatGPT. All right. So what I want to spend a little bit of time on is strategies for student engagement uses of AI. And I'm just going to show you a handful of these um, and then show you a couple of things that I've done with it. OK, so oops, got to go back. Um, we're trying to get to the things where our level three, level four thinking, strategic thinking, extended thinking, where there's more reasoning um, and you're getting, this, you're using it to develop something the students are going to use um, to do the level and three, level four depth of knowledge. All right. Uh, some powerful things to tell it. Act as if, give it that role, act as if you're my personal tutor for my high school personal finance course. Um, create a weekly study plan for me. Tell me what else you need to do this. That's also a very important phrase. Tell me what else you need to do this because then it will tell you like, let's say, um, you know, they might say what, 
you know, what have you learned already? Or I'm thinking more of like a, a nutrition plan. They might say like, what's your weight? What's your age? You know, what's your BMI? If you have that, they, they, it will ask you these things and try to tailor uh, a more personal answer for you. And that's always hard for a teacher who's got, you know, 35, 36 students in a class. This is a way that you can start to personalize education a little bit more. All right. Um, if you ever want to see the, the powerfulness of it, this was my aha moment, whereas like I was like, oh, my gosh, this isn't just a better Google. This is something different. Um, I asked ChatGPT to help me practice interview skills. Um, and I said, I want you to act as an interviewer. I will be the candidate. You will ask me to interview questions for a college admissions interview. I want you to only reply as an interviewer. Do not write all the conversation at once. I want you to only do the interview with me. Ask me the questions. Wait for my answers. So again, giving it very specific instructions. And um, it, it acts as the interviewer. Like, what makes you want to come to, to our school? And I say, well, because I really like the football team. And it'll say, like, that's great. But academically, what really interests you in our university? Um, so it really redirects very well. Uh, debate with chat GPT. I think dialogue is important. Understanding the other side is important. Um, seeing both sides of things, especially as we get into our silos of social media, right? Um, so I want you to debate a topic with me, take the opposite stance as mine, um, and, and to go back and forth with that, telling it to provide one counter argument at a time, wait for me to respond. And uh, that can be a very powerful thing to see the other side of things um, and ask students to to do that. And then you can have the students um, share that with you. So when you're done with ChatGPT, there's like a share button and you can have them email that to you um, as a teacher. So, or, or print it as a PDF or whatever, however you want that turned in. Um, so that's pretty cool. It's great. It, it um, lists. So uh, you know, a student can ask ChatGPT for a list of five examples of topics. So it they could, um, as an example, what are five reasons why the U.S. is facing a shortage of people choosing to become certified public accountants? Um, and then it would give five reasons. And then maybe the student has to do a deeper dive into one of those reasons. Okay, so it depends on, again, what you do as a teacher with these results. Um, I like this idea where you, know, you can go online, get a, a graph of Ford stock over time, which jumped up a little bit yesterday. I saw that. Um, but provide a graph of the stock price for Ford Motor Company over time and uh, have them describe something on the graph in a chat GPT prompt to obtain a response that tells more of the story. So the example here would be, you know, they would look and analyze the chart, right? That's what we want students to do, an analysis. So they would look at the chart and go, huh, in 1998, their stock jumped. I wonder why. And so they have a wonder now. And now they can go to chat GPT with that wonder and dig a little bit deeper and find out more about what happened in 1998. So you're using different tools to help, um, you know, have some analysis and some higher order thinking skills there. Um, I'm gonna do a couple more of these and then um, show you a couple things and then pause for questions and talk, but you can make the text more approachable. You can paste the most recent FOMC statement. So the, the statement that the Federal Reserve gives about interest rates, um, it's like a one page thing, copy that, you paste it in ChatGPT and you say, rewrite the statement in the style of Taylor Swift. Or my favorite personally is rewrite the statement in the style of LL Cool J. And it is hilarious. It, I mean, and then you can have a student wrap it. Like, okay, anybody want to wrap this? They'll be hands up like, oh yeah, yeah, I want to wrap that. Because it starts off like, yo, yo, we drop on the interest rates today. You know, and it's like hilarious um, how funny it is. And it's like, it rhymes, it's accurate. Um, there's nothing wrong with the statement. It really gets the point of the statement across. Um, it it summarizes what's going on in the economy, why that action was taken. Um, it's crazy awesome. So that's one way. Um, create a scenario for students to utilize in a role play situation. So I did this to create an assignment for, um, for my position. I, I, what I wanted to do is, as a teacher, I always wanted the students to be in the position of an underwriter for an auto insurance policy. And I never put together the assignment, but I always wanted them to do that. Like, I'm like, everybody wants lower auto insurance rates. Everybody wants that. Like, everybody complains about that, but let's look at it from their perspective, right? So 
how are they determining insurance rates? Um, you know, how are they looking at your level of risk and uh, cost of insurance? So I just basically told ChatGPT, I said, give me a um, safe driver, give me a medium risk driver, give me a more a, a high risk driver, use the same criteria for each of these drivers um, and, and provide examples. So like for the risky driver, it said, you know, Joe has received three tickets in the last year, um, you know, and, and all the criteria that makes somebody a, a higher risk driver was kind of hit on that. And then all I had to do was basically say, um, based upon these points, here's the cost of insurance, but it, it did the heavy lifting for me, which was creating those scenarios. So in maybe 15 minutes, I had an assignment that I just never had the time to put together before. Um, it can do some pretty powerful things. It can create a business model for a haunted house. Um, this year for our personal finance challenge, I'm definitely going to use it to help me create the case study, which usually takes me a good part of a week to complete. Um, I'm thinking I'll be able to get it done in two days now because of this. Um, so, you know, you can have it create a business model, model for a haunted house that's open two months a year. I actually did this with an assignment back in October. Um, and then the students have to calculate some of the data um, and determine basically the, the student activity and outcome was to determine what the break-even price is for admission to the haunted house. So they were given the data set which would take me as a teacher a long time to figure all this out and make sure that all the data makes sense and calculates and works correctly. Um, the chat GPT did it for me. And again, 15 minutes, I had the basics of what I needed to create the assignment. Um, and the students had to figure out what the break-even price was and, and look at profit and all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, and I'm going to stop right here and, and basically talk about this and show you a couple quick things. Now with the GPT-4, you can upload images. Um, so what it, I've done before, and I've gotten mixed results on this one, um, but you can take an AP US history, old AP test, a released AP test. You can copy the text of the question that was on the AP test in the re response questions part and paste it into ChatGPT. You can save this image that was used on that test and attach it to ChatGPT, and it will provide an answer um, that is a correct answer for this AP test uh, question. So um, this one, I've got a little bit of mixed results, but usually it gives me the right one on this. So uh, that's a new, and that's only in the GPT-4, the paid version, that you'd be able to get that. So I'm going to um, escape there and, and uh, kind of show you what I did this morning, right before our presentation, I went and took a picture of my beautiful vehicle that I cleaned this weekend. Thank goodness. Um, so I took a picture of this and put in chat GPT and just asked it, what your make and model is this vehicle? And, you know, you can't even see anything on the side, right? No distinguishing marks. And it says the vehicle in the image appears to be a Ford Edge. Based on the design styling, it looks like a model from around the years 2011 to 2014. Um, which it's not, it was a, it's a 2009, um, but it says that it underwent a fateless facelift in 2011, identifying the exact year would require a closer inspection of specific year by year changes or interior features that are not visible in this photo. So it kind of tells you like, it, it might not be right. You might need some more information here. Um, or you could have asked it, right? Like I didn't give it a very good prop. I could have said, you know, what else do you need to know what year this is? And maybe it would you know, take a picture of it for me. Um, so that's, if I would, you know, open up the door and take in a picture of the interior, maybe it would have, would have gotten it right. Um, and so that's kind of some of the power that you can have with it. Now, I also wanted to show you again, you can create your own um, GPTs. This is my uh, Taylor Swift economics GPT. And, uh, Taylor helps create examples of economic principles from her music. And you can type in things there to message Taylor Swift Economics. You can have this attachment thing and attach a document. Um, there's other things you can do in the um, custom instructions. If I go to custom instructions, I can 
tell ChatGPT some basics to know to provide better responses. Maybe, you know, I'm a high school economics teacher. Um, how would you like ChatGPT to respond? You know, I would like ChatGPT to respond in a friendly tone or, you know, these are tone types of things that you could put in there. Um, you know, respond snarky to everything that I say. It, it will do what you tell it to um, in those those areas there. So uh, Dali is the image generator one. If you click Dali, you can uh, you know, type in prompts to have it create, you know, uh, graphic images. So what I, uh, the last thing I, I kind of want to do before we open up some questions is just let you know that there's, I've got what, a bunch of different things here. I've got another 20 examples or so you can go through of how to use ChatGPT, how teachers might want to use ChatGPT, um, as well as some other tools other than ChatGPT, such as uh, MidJourney and uh, some prompt generators and some that are specifically designed for uh, for schools. And, and the way I look at it, like a lot of these things like Class Companion and, and these other tools are probably using ChatGPT. Um, it's just the interface that you're using it from and and how it allows things to be organized. Um, so learning ChatGPT is probably the first step in understanding how that works. It's probably the first step. And then you understand how these tools are using ChatGPT. Uh, Eleven Labs is the voice one that I showed you. And there's some other things like Conquer that creates quiz and test questions. Again, all these things are possible in ChatGPT. Um, it can analyze PDFs and uh, some other tools there as well, some other reading. Um, that I'm not going to get into right now because I want to pause and make sure we've got time for, for questions and discussion. So I'll stop my screen share. Kelly, do you want to lead us off if you have any questions to get us going? Yeah. So as uh, as we do this kind of the, the um, interactive part, if everyone could rename themselves, I find it helpful to know, like I see Sarah, you know, put in her name and then case credit union. If everyone could do that, then we all know kind of who's asking what and it helps with perspective, I think. Um, so recently, so many people in my universe have said that they're using this professionally, right? So whether it be with students, classroom, workshops, presentations, that's one thing, but almost, I'm one of the few people that I know who are not using one of these AI, because uh, chat GPT is one, right? But there are a lot, there are, are several, um, to make themselves more efficient in their work. And I'm talking about like someone who runs uh, um, a marketing company, someone who is an assistant superintendent of a very large school district. Um, so I'm curious to know if the folks on the call are currently using any artificial intelligence in their, as a professional, like today I think is almost like a professional development workshop, right? To be thinking about how do you do what you do more efficiently in that piece of reviewing the outputs is obviously very crucial, but I'm curious to know in the room if folks have personal experience of using it in your profession, whether you work in a library or a credit union or a government agency. Shannon says, I haven't used it yet. Okay. And is there a reason why? And I'm not, this is not judgment, believe me, because I'm not using it either. So I'm just curious if, if there's a reason why people aren't, if it's like company policy or it's just an uh, uncertain don't know exactly where to start. Okay. Now Shannon's got a place to start. No excuses, Shannon. I can find you too. You, you live right by me. <laughs> Good. Yeah, Shannon, I'm glad this was helpful. <laughs> I will kind of start. I, um, I've used it very minimally, but I have like, um, my manager is really great at adding fluff to email and what to say. And so she's want, that's a goal she's made for me this year. And so I've kind of used it, like we just released our scholarships. So I put in there like um, excited email to announce scholarships. And of course, like I don't just copy and paste it and use it as it is, but pull different pieces. Um, so there's still obviously that aspect that it is coming from me, but it just is providing me more ideas of that fluff to add 
Um, that's really helpful. Instead of me sitting here racking my brain for like 10, 20 minutes of how I can add more to the email. What about in library world? Laura, um, I hate to pick on you, but you're kind of representing this morning. So what about in library world? I, I feel that we do a lot of researching kind of things, but I do also know that people come in from all areas of our of life and come to the library and ask questions and are searching. And I just think this might be a really neat tool for us to know how to use so that they can get answers in a better way, I think. So I, I'm I'm not familiar with this at all. Tomorrow we have our first AI program here at the library, and I wanted to jump in when this I saw this yesterday. I thought, what? <laughs> so I got to This is very good, and I appreciate your information. And we'll go with it more tomorrow. But I think in the library we get a lot of people looking for things and asking, and I think this will be helpful. Sure. I mean, I know I've seen memes, right? Memes that and and they're true. It's like. If you want to know anything about anything in the universe, go talk to a librarian, right? Like, so there's this assumption that y'all either know the answers or know how to get help people find the answers to the, you know, the, every potential question in, in the universe. So, um, and the quality of the AI in the session I went to on Saturday um, was from a guy whose like literal job is like, researching and understanding all these AI platforms like that is his full-time job and um and he said you know the quality of the results are so incredible as you know he showed the timeline of you know accuracy and quality because they're they're constantly the AI machine is you know taking in information and data points nonstop about from from you know millions and millions and millions of individuals and that's how they have become uh this resource right for 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 our use of artif artificial intelligence and he said but you still will have the occasional misfire or inaccuracy um and so you can't take out the human element entirely you know, we still need thinking people to evaluate output because things, you know, you, you can't just presume that it's all going to be, um, showed examples of how this is enhancing what we're all trying to do and not taking our uniqueness from us, the history, et cetera. I think this is a really light bulb moment for me that helped me in my case. Yeah. You know, Kelly, I want to show one more thing on my screen here. This is an example of something I created a couple of weeks ago as an assignment. Um, misery index matching. It was a Monday morning economist on misery index. And so we gave them the unemployment rate consumer price index, which is really the misery index um, over time. And then we gave them some data points in months and years. And they had to figure out which consumer matched up with the misery index. So a higher misery index, bad, right? So like June 1974, bad because of the inflation and things. Um, so what ChatGPT helped me do was create these hypothetical consumers. So I said, create a hypothetical consumer um, from the year 1974, be sure to describe what, how the economy is impacting their life. And so it gave me this output of consumer one here and then consumer two. I mean, imagine how long it would take to develop something like this. Here's consumer five, here's consumer six, but now the students are going to be, um, looking for context clues in that, right? Like, oh, 9-11 attacks, okay. Some other things that tell them what's going on and where that is. And that's that's like analysis. That's high level stuff that we want students to be doing. That's critical thinking we want them to be doing. And I would never be able to get them there without having this tool to use. So again, that's, that's where I love it so much. I wish I had it when I taught science a couple of years ago, because yeah, to make those like high level projects, Took, like it takes so long as a teacher, but with this, like what you just showed, like it's incredible. And I think teachers while will be able to make these more like in-depth projects that, you know, yes, there's the, the way that the kids could cheat by having it write its essay for them or whatever. But on the flip side, the teacher can create these projects where, you know, they can try to eliminate the teaching as, or the cheating as much as possible.
So to your question of if we're using it, mm -hmm. only dabbling in it right now. Um, but I used it. I had someone um, ask for an article for something and I sent it to them and I I don't write for their publication often. So I just said, like, if you need to change anything in it to change the voice, to have it match your publication, that's fine. You just needed the facts from me and here they are. Um, and she wrote back, have you put this through chat GPT for corrections? And I was like, no. <laughs> First off, because I was like, this is the information that's in my head. Like there's not a way for it to check my work. Um, and it did not produce a great result. I think partially because I didn't know how to do a good prompt for it, but also like it, it just couldn't edit numbers and data because it didn't know what went with what, and it just didn't work well. Um, but since then, like while we were having this conversation, I'm teaching about insurance at 11 o'clock and I was like, what? Talking about car insurance. So I just made a whole thing and it came out a lot better because of Derek's suggestions. So that's nice. already much better. Um, but we did use it to write a conference proposal where we had the conference proposal all flushed out and we put it in and we said like, this is your audience. Can you make this sound engaging and interactive? Uh, and it came back and it was way better than what we had written. Um, so we'll see, we don't know if it's been accepted, but we all recognize that the very business-minded people in our group were not writing in the way that people who are interested in like sewing projects were gonna be reading. So we it changed the voice nicely in that regard. Um, though I those, are, those are a couple of really good examples. There's the challenge of like growing up as a somebody who had a computer starting in like fourth grade, right? making that transition was easy because it was embedded in everything I did. But now trying to learn this while continuing to do all the things we're already doing is where I am struggling. Like I would love to have a couple hours a week where I could practice this and get really good at it. But the programs keep coming and there just isn't time, which this must be what it was like for my parents when we had computers <laughs> coming in. Like, I feel like that's where we're at. It's the same sort of, um, you're either going to be a native to this or someone who's scrambling to figure it out on the behind the curve <laughs> well and I think hopefully I mean Derek correct me if I'm wrong but the goal one of the the benefits I guess of using AI is to Jill's point for people that have this you know fire hose of demands on their time is if she is able to become proficient it should actually save her time, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just like the personal computer uh, didn't allow us all to work, you know, three day work weeks. Um, it, it's just going to allow you to be more productive and, and maybe be able to handle better uh, what's coming at you. Um, but even so, I mean, I'm feeling overwhelmed this week with all the stuff coming at me, and I've got pretty proficient use of Chat GPT. So I think that's just called life in the big city. But you know, I really feel that. I don't know. I feel like I'm, I was born at a perfect time, right? Like I was born at a time where I went through school and had to learn how to do everything without a computer. I had to go look up and use the card catalog. I had to do all those, all those things, um, type my papers. And then I was young enough though, when the internet came that I could adopt it and, and use it and see the powerfulness, powerfulness of it, but also knew how everything worked. So right. I like that, uh, part of, of my age, um, I I do think it would be a little bit scary to not have seen the how it was done in the past. So uh, that is a question mark of how that, I think that's a good uh, thing to think about the natives versus the adopters, um, how that's gonna flush out over time. Yeah, like making kids do math longhand so that they understand the functionality of it, but then by all means, use your calculator, right? Because <laughs> I worry that, you know, original thought, right? This this AI world is very, it has in just very short period of time has gone from, it's like this in terms of knowledge and understanding and functionality and kids younger than my daughter how are they going to be able to have original thought and know how to write from its most basic 
you know, um, so I don't know. It, it, that's why my emoji was like, ooh, big eyes. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not sure because I can see the definite benefits. I can also see some of the downside. Um, well, I mean, you could just start using it for fun, right? Like put in some ingredients in your fridge and tell it to give you a recipe. Um, you know, just that's how I learned like, these types of things. I just start playing around and uh, pretty soon you, you start to get a little bit more comfortable with it. 1% each day type of thing, you know? And Derek, yeah. I didn't, I thank you for sharing all the ideas of the projects because I didn't even think to use it for that because that is such a time consuming thing. And so I'm thinking like from next gen personal finance, I use like a credit score activity and my credit um, presentation and I use it with adults. I use it with high schoolers and they always really love it. So I've been wanting to think of what kind of activity can I do with my other presentations that's similar. So now that's what I'm going to play around with because there isn't a lot of, you know, hands-on activities that are fun, especially to teach adults financial topics. So um, I'm excited to kind of play around with it and see what it gives me. Well, and Sarah, once you've done that, let's make you a featured speaker and you can share the <laughs> output of your hard work. <laughs> I'll let you know when I get to that point. <laughs> Awesome. Kathy, were you going to say something? Oh yeah. I, I just wanted to say this was, this has been great. I, I'm in a similar boat that Jill's in. Um, it's been on my list. I put it in my, my plan this year to learn it and use it. Um, I've taken another class, but I really love these examples and having, um, your presentation to, you know, explore some of these other sites. Um, it's on my list. It's, um, and if it can make my life easier, you know, I'm, I'm for it. Um, cause there's always more things coming at you yeah. and, uh, but, but I do worry just like you, Kelly, you know, um, although like writing's not like writing is my least favorite thing to do and, and I struggle. So if I could just get some prompts to get over that, that hump, you know, and then make it my own, it would save tons and tons of time. So that's what I mostly use it for, Kathy. So <laughs> and, 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 and adding that, that fluff. area, a adding that fluff, because I'm not a fluff person either. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really great. And again, you don't have to use it all. You just sift through like what's great right. that you can use or add to it. And it's been really helpful in that aspect. So thank um, you so much. Before we adjourn, Lacey, do you have anything that you want to add or um, Maria, anybody that we haven't heard from today? Anybody to feel left out? No, my brain's still processing all this. No, this is I'm a lot. Really <laughs> okay. All right, good. So you found value in this. That's, that's what I was hoping. Yeah. Um, I, I teach, I, I, you know, I teach, um, at a community college and it's that's our biggest conversation is the students using it for you know plagiarism and how do we combat it and yeah yeah they're they've been cheating for a while just oh that's way. true that's just true this is just <laughs> another this is just another method added to their toolkit yes <laughs> yeah yeah and frankly you know i have a friend who teaches at a community college um and she teaches English and, you know, these, these uh, uh, AI evaluators, right? So they're putting all the students work in through these uh, evaluator uh, apps and she is routinely failing students at the college level. And she's very clear up front, like there is zero tolerance right now for turning in work that is not yours. And so there is a conversation that's going to, that is happening. I know because what if the evaluator is wrong? Right. And, and it comes back as a 52% violation. Well, is it really that? Like, and so, and th these are like, like life consequences, right? Like you fail somebody at the college level um, on a class that, you know, may or may not have violated the, the university's um, policy. And is the policy keeping up with the times? Right. So there's all these layers of conversations that I know our school district here in Northfield are having, and I'm sure are being had at, at all the, you know, all levels, including post-secondary. Um, 
but you know, it's, it's not going away. That's what's come, you know, very clear to me over these last couple of months. It's not going away. It's transforming our universe and how we move through the world and how we consume information. And so I just wanted to have a little better insight into, you know, ways that we can utilize it for good to be more productive and do more of what we need to do. Um, knowing that there are, of course, and I worry about our young people and, um, you know, things that are access and uh, um, there's a whole other conversation about, you know, safety and being, you know, duped into thinking certain things that are not real and it, a whole extension of, you know, just online safety for our kids. Um, police department did a presentation about that um, over the weekend too. So, um, but with that, I am going to thank everyone who made it this morning. Thank Derek for uh, sharing and giving us a, a a little bit of a deep dive, um, at least put our toe in the in the water. And then also remind everybody next month, uh, March 13th, we're going to do a similar deep dive into Smart Path from a very practical perspective. I know we've done some kind of all on the surface um reviews of smart path in the past but i feel like even i need to better understand um, how it can be utilized in a non-traditional classroom and even for students who are above eighth grade who are functioning at a lower level i think there are a lot of social service agencies that might be able to utilize this platform to help young people um, in a lot of different environments including you know the barn where we have uh, groups of young people meet for um, their kind of therapeutic equestrian experience, um, but financial education for them is going to be crucial. And even though they might be sophomores or juniors in high school, they may not be really at that level. And so I want to better understand how Smart Path can be utilized. I know it's geared toward, you know, K-8, but um, so invite your network uh, to next month's meeting. Feel free to share the registration link, um, because I'd love to have a lot of informal educators uh, who are not in the classroom because at, you know, 8.30 on a Wednesday, most teachers are teaching. Uh, but those of us who work with young people outside of a traditional classroom, I'd love to have um, a good audience for that next month. So, all right, any parting thoughts or I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn us. Um, I, if, if possible, I'd like to talk with Derek because we have this cash composition contest um, that is sponsored by Extra Credit Union. And this sort of brought up my concern, like if, if kids are using the chat GPT to write the um, their essay, how do we go about, is there a site that we would put it in to like sort of um, evaluate, like what's the chances that they just use chat GPT or? Yeah, there are sites out there to do that. Um, I'm not honestly an expert in that area at all. Okay. Um, so it just be starting from scratch with a search, but I'm sure that you can find those out there that you can run the, um, plagiarism checks through. I know that Lake Michigan credit union is doing an essay contest and they have a plagiarism check that they used. So you might want to check with the people at Lake Michigan credit union about what they use. Cause I just evaluated some essays yesterday for them. Okay. Lake Michigan uh, credit union. Okay. Yes. Thanks. That'd be great. Appreciate your right. input. I will see everybody. I'm just going to stop the recording. I mean, I can leave the, the room open. We can continue discussion. I'm going to stop the recording, though, and thank everyone and hope to see a lot of folks on our uh, March 13th Zoom. See you soon. Thanks for organizing, Kelly. Sure. Bye.